Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad Podcast. My name is Mike Keenitz. I'm a PT assistant. Today, I'm interviewing Jordan again. She has her bachelor's in exercise science, master's in nutrition, and she is a certified personal trainer. Today, we are talking about everything intermittent fasting. So without further ado, here is Jordan. Well, welcome back to the show, Jordan. Hey, thanks, Mike. So today, we are talking about intermittent fasting. So what is intermittent fasting? All right. So I guess, yeah. So just from a basic standpoint, um, intermittent fasting is kind of a big, big term um, that we're going to really kind of dive into today and break it down. But from a very general standpoint first, um, it's kind of a, it's also referred to as time restricted eat feeding or eating. Um, that sometimes makes more sense to me. Uh, so think of it as a compressed eating window. So where you only eat for a certain period of time during the day, and then the rest of the time you're fasting. Um, that's one version of it. I'll go into that later. But basically, um, general sense, you are refraining from food and certain beverages for a set period of time, ranging from a few hours to a few days. Does that make sense? Yeah. You probably know what intermittent fasting is, though. But yeah, I haven't Technically, I'm doing it right now because I haven't eaten yet today, but there you go. I don't really pre plan it. All right. So, how many hours should someone fast, and how long does someone need to fast before they would see any benefits? So, um, the bare minimum, okay, let's just start with like the bare minimum um, of this to see any sort of benefit from it or to really even call it fasting. Um, I've done a lot dove into this quite a bit. Um, and I saw a lot of general trends. So first of all, bare minimum that every single person, um, that honestly could benefit from, like we should all fast for 12 hours. Right. Um, not, not that yeah. hard. No, it's not. And that's, that is not even really coined as fasting. That's just what we could all benefit from as humans to not be eating all the time. So basically, um, from a simple standpoint, your last meal of the day or snack is at seven o'clock. Don't eat till seven. I mean, that's, in my opinion, fairly easy, um, depending upon lifestyle. Um, but basically, that is just enough time for your digestive system to rest and recover. Um, so that's just bare minimum. Now, how long do you need to see benefits? Um, so with ton of resources that I looked at, books, other podcasts, research articles. It seems like the magic number is like 16 hours fasting, eight hours feeding. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that someone could adopt intermittent fasting into their lifestyle. Um, so the, what I was just describing there is basically where, kind of the traditional like intermittent fasting where it's a daily thing. So like maybe you eat from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and the rest of the time you're fasting. That's probably what you're talking about you're doing right now. Yeah, I just, I kind of eat when I'm hungry. I mean, I have a flexible schedule luckily because I work from home. So, yeah. I mean, I eat around 10 or 11 in the morning and then I usually eat dinner. Usually I'm done eating by six or sometimes seven depends, but. So you naturally just do it anyway. Or do you do that on purpose? No, I, I just naturally kind of do it now. I, I did it on purpose when I first heard about it. And I found it because I used to do like a lot of small meals through the day. And honestly, mm -hmm. I kind of don't like that because it's way more prep. Yeah. So I'd rather just eat bigger meals and just less. It just kind of naturally falls that way for me now. Right. In this whole like compressed eating window, this is one way to do this, um, which I kind of want to talk about because everybody's lifestyle is different. Not every, and I have more of a flexible schedule like you too, where um, my hours are very odd, odd hours. I'm not the eight to five office person. Um, so I have the ability to eat when I want to eat. Um, so for, for you or I and somebody who has that flexible schedule, I think the compressed eating window, meaning like I'm only going to eat for eight hours of the day and the other um, 16 hours I'm going to fast, um, that, that works really well for that kind of individual. However, there are other types and ways that you can do this. So for example, um, if you've heard of like alternate day fasting, so like every other day you have like your feast day and your famine day, if you will, um, where you would maybe just eat super low calorie. Um, that's another like technically, that's not my favorite way of doing it, but, um, or there's also the 
I don't love, love this, but the one meal a day, um, that's very trendy, hot topic too. Have you heard of that? Yeah. They call it OMAD, O-M-A-D. Um, so you're literally, you would just literally would eat one meal a day. Um, and I'll talk about some of the nuances later in the podcast too of um, some issues with that. But um, just know when you hear the term intermittent fasting, there's a lot of ways um, that somebody could do it. Um, I think the most realistic and beneficial from, my, I'm going to call it an opinion because nutrition research is far from being done, right? But I think the 16 hour fast with the eight hour um, feeding window seems to be kind of the hitting it right on, on the head with what's most beneficial and realistic too. Yeah. The first book I heard on it was called, I think it was called the eight hour diet. It was probably eight years ago or so that mm -hmm. came out, but yeah, I was kind of talking about the 16, eight, which it's a little weird. And if you're starting, it's best to just wait on breakfast. I found personally, yeah. unless obviously if you work construction, maybe you want to, <laughs> eat breakfast. It's a little different for those people. But that's see, that's the the caveat to all of this is it's just it's this topic is, and I'll get into that too, but it is so individualized. And for some yeah. people, um, you know, you might be gone away from your house for 10 hours and your only chance to get a really good, decent meal um that's not on the go is like eating a really good solid breakfast at home. Well then you probably shouldn't skip breakfast. Or if you have a super active um job probably not in your best interest to skip breakfast but if you're sitting on your butt in an office and you can just wait you know there's some benefit there there's um they didn't talk about it in the article i don't know if you know who uh metcalf is the wide receiver for seattle oh i'm not a big sports guy mike oh, he's uh <laughs> he's in very good shape but he would literally go to football practice in the morning and not eat at all. And he's a big guy. But then afterwards, he would buy like two big things of like gummy candies <laughs> and then eat like a really big dinner. But he just didn't like he liked to train fast. That he's kind of. Oh, OK, uh, it's working for him. But I would right. suggest people breaking their fast with two things of candy. No, no, I would, <laughs> I would say probably not. No. So what are the main benefits of intermittent fasting? Yeah. So why would somebody even want to do this in the first place? Um, well, first of all, I'm going to touch on the fact that like as a country, as a nation, we are, we're overweight, right? Um, I'm going to, I'm just saying we, in a general sense of our country is just not healthy. Um, we're myself working in the fitness and nutrition industry. Um, the most common thing people come to me for is weight loss. It just, it is because unfortunately we're just not getting healthier. So intermittent fasting, I think one of the main, I don't want to call it benefit, but a lot of reason why somebody might try it in the first place is for weight loss. Um, for one, um, when you have a compressed eating window for a lot of people, it's just going to overall um, lower your caloric intake um, if you're not eating all day long. So that's, one way and the mechanism of litter, it sounds so simple, but how it will help with weight loss. Um, it also helps to boost your metabolism as well. Um, it helps your body turn to fat for fuel. So when you're in your fasted state, um, normally when we're metabolizing, um, we're just using up all of our glycogen stores, um, our sugars, carbohydrates from our diet. Um, but when you actually stop eating for a little bit and you give your body a chance to use up those glycogen stores, it's going to actually look to fats or adipose tissue in your body as fuel and break that down. So that's how, another way it can help aid in weight loss. Right. And you typically have glycogen stores still the next day. Cause I mean, I've gone running, not eaten like 18 miles before and I'm fine. You're okay. Right? I don't, I mean, I'm not sprinting. It's slow running, but um, yeah. But you're probably a little bit more adapted to that than somebody who's just comprising 80% of their diet from carbohydrates and they, yeah, get, yeah it's, water it's a little different for everyone, but right. And I would um, say, yeah, the fasting just most people eat junk food or snacks at night when they're watching yeah. TV. So if you're like, oh, I'm not supposed to eat after dinner, it kind of eliminates all that, right. Right. For sure. So, um, 
Well, and another thing too, with like the whole weight loss conversation, I'm going to talk about way more benefits than just weight loss, but um, it also, the further you get into intermittent fasting and you can maybe attest to this, but it also helps to just reduce your cravings too. If you're not constantly feasting the entire day long, um, your cravings are going to go down. If you can yeah. speak to that. I would, I would say too, if you're just starting it, like when I first did it, it might be kind of weird the first few days because it's a habit of eating right. snacks at night. And then once you get acclimated to it, like maybe you're hungry or crave something, but then it goes away after a little bit. Right. And I find if you just keep your mind occupied with something, you don't even focus on it anymore. Don't think about it. Yeah. yeah. Or just change your habits. Cause if I just sit there and watch TV, you know, I get kind of TV is not always engaging. <laughs> right. Other things. So right. you like tend to want to snack then like I found this doing something else like a hobby of mine instead of watching TV for a super long time like just I don't think about it then. That is a that is a great point. Yeah. 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 That's I, tend to be why people um overeat more and overindulge on the weekends cuz we're not I, yeah. I think for some people you're just not keeping yourself busy um like you are during the week um and so you have more time to focus on that then. So Yeah. Yeah, and it's, no, that's yeah. just a little, little hack. Um, outside of um, just weight loss, though, there's more benefits. So if you're you're listening to this and you're like, I, I don't need to lose weight because I know we have a ton of healthy viewers, too, that might be at their optimal body composition. Great. There are a lot of other benefits to it as well. So first of all, if you have any like gut or digestive health, like this is one of my as a nutritional um, health coach, like one of my go-tos for people is talking about um, some degree of intermittent fasting um, because if you actually give your gut and digestive system a break, it can improve a lot of like gut or digestive health issues because um, if we're constantly placing demands on it, like feeding ourselves all day long, it never has a chance. Just like we need to sleep and relax, your digestive system needs a break too. So. Yeah. I would say if you get like a lot of bloat too, like that really helps mm -hmm. getting a long time from not eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, the other, like a couple other things to just kind of like spew off too. Um, it helps to promote cellular um, regeneration as well. So when you're not constantly demanding your body to digest food, your body can actually take time to do other things such as repair cells. Um, so damaged cells in our body can go uh, and clean up um, damage in the body. Um, it also helps to support healthy blood sugar levels as well. Um, helps to improve your immune health. Um, your immune system can actually work and amped up again when digestion can kind of settle down for a little bit. Um, and then it's been shown too, just with helping with a lot of different heart health um, markers, blood markers, such as, you know, improving your blood pressure, um, improving triglyceride levels, so lowering your triglycerides, um, improving cholesterol levels as well. There's a good deal of research on all of that. Um, and then I can't talk about intermittent fasting without talking about brain health too. There's actually entire books that have been written on this. Um, to help with both short-term and long-term. So um, while you or I might not necessarily be focused on preventing dementia yet, at least I don't, <laughs> I should think about that because we're all aging, but, um, but you know, somebody um, older, that's super important to think about. And there's a lot of good research going on and how this can help prevent, you know, cognitive decline or dementia. Um, and then, but short-term also helps, which is focus, honestly too. Yeah. So is there anyone that intermittent fasting is not appropriate for? Yeah. So, um, intermittent fasting is defined to like more than a 12 hour fast. I think probably, and always just, you know, everybody's individualized. So just do know that, but I would say the great majority of people can still benefit from like, at least let your digestive system rest for 12 hours. Okay. But when I'm talking intermittent fasting, I'm talking more of like 14 plus hours of fasting. Okay. Some individuals that should be careful. Um, well, first of all, men and women are not created equal. Right. We're women, not. What's that? I said, we're not. No. Oh. 
you're, you're on like a 24 hour cycle, Mike, I'm on, you know, more of a 30 day cycle. So we have a ton as women, a ton of hormone fluctuations, whether we're talking about, um, premenopausal or postmenopausal, a lot of hormone fluctuations that can go on. So I really want to caution women of childbearing years. Um, so I kind of fall into that category. Um, and if I was somebody who was trying to conceive right now, I might want to be pretty careful of intermittent fasting. Big reason for that is what that can tell and signal in my body is I don't have enough right now. So I don't have enough to share. And so I probably don't want to create another life right now because I'm in kind of a little bit of a famine state. Does that make sense? Yeah. I've obviously never thought about it because I'm a guy, but huh. Of yeah. course. Right. Now, there can be some women um, who could actually get great benefit when they're trying to conceive by partaking in intermittent fasting, but not every woman is a candidate for that. Um so if you are, and I don't mean to, to talk all about women's cycles here, Mike, and make you uncomfortable, but um, you don't have to comment on this. I'll just talk. Um, if you're a woman that's, you know, not cycling normally, intermittent fasting is probably not a great idea because your hormones are already having trouble um, being in sync. So I probably would caution you is all I'm saying. Um, Another, still speaking of women um, who are pregnant, probably not a great idea. Um, breastfeeding even, probably still not a great idea. Um, if somebody, if you're an individual who already has a very low body weight or low body fat percentage, um, this can elicit a greater um, loss in body weight if you're more susceptible to that. So you may, that might not be a great um you might not be a great candidate for intermittent fasting if you already struggle to keep weight on. Right. Um, if you're somebody who's undergoing a ton of chronic stress, like you get a lot going on in your life and you are just barely hanging on, um, intermittent fasting does actually induce a little bit of a stress stressor load on the body. Um, not in a bad way, but it is an extra stress for your body. And if you're already like, in that fight or flight, like barely hanging on, probably not the best idea to um, add this to your plate, if that makes sense. Yeah, especially if you're someone that's, I, if, if you're super hungry when you wake up, like you probably shouldn't fast. Amen. And add more stress. Correct. Right. Exactly. That's kind of, I think, the concept too with like, because I was pregnant a year ago and, um, your, your, your hunger signals do change because you've got, you know, another human that you're trying to grow. And so, um, I didn't, I have more of a, a schedule like you too, um, with my fasting. But when I was pregnant, if I woke up hungry, I'm going to feed my body. Cause that's, you know, you gotta be intuitive too. If your body's signaling and telling you something, you should probably go ahead and listen to it. Yeah. Um, and let's see here. Kids and teens, I'm not recommending it for that age group. So don't go home and have your 12-year-old participate in intermittent fasting. They have a lot going on and brain development. So I would caution against that. Um, diabetics, I would, I'm not saying that no diabetic should ever partake in intermittent fasting. However, I'm not going to come on here and recommend it for diabetics. I would tell you, you should definitely consult with your um, doctor before you try that. Um, someone who's engaging in like a super intensive exercise or training program, you might want to just exercise caution before starting it. Well, I mean, like you said, there's that, you said football player, pro football yeah. player. So it can work, but I'm just saying, I'm trying to talk about certain audiences where it may not be good for is all. Yeah. It's kind of experimental. Like if I'm just doing like steady state cardio i feel fine if i'm trying to lift weights i usually don't like it in a fasted state some people do but i don't yeah no, i like I, to have some food in me first i love um i love morning workouts like i just it sets my my tone for the day but it depends on the kind of workout i'm doing like this morning i was up at four because my job is there's crazy early hours, but, um, and then I did my, so I was up at four. I don't eat. I drink a cup of black coffee and just drink water. Um, and then I did my workout at six 30. So I had been up for two and a half hours. I was fasted, but I wasn't going for strength today. Today was a little bit more of like a, 
light day hit training kind of thing. I love it. And then I went home and I ate breakfast at like eight. And that was great. I felt great. Um, my digestive health feels great. Now, if I were going to go try to max out on deadlifts, I'm going to do that later in the day after I've eaten. Yeah. You typically want some food and you have some energy. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's individualistic too, but you get so, up early. Yeah. Four o'clock. Yeah. I rolled out of bed like at eight. <laughs> Yeah. And so speaking of intermittent fasting, when I wake up at four, like, so I, I ate my last meal last night at, let's see, 630. I was done eating. Um, that's just when we had dinner. Um, well, I, I ate today at eight. So that's not, that's not even near 16 hours. But when you wake up at four in the morning, that's a little against the um, biological clock. And by eight o'clock this morning, and especially after a workout, I was super hungry. So there's an example where I don't have rigid rules for this. This is just, that's just what worked in my lifestyle today. But I do try to never break the whole 12 hour rule. If that makes sense. Yeah. And it, it varies. Cause I mean, I've had days where I'm, I'm not hungry in the morning, but if I had like a lot of training and I burned a lot of calories that day, sometimes after dinner, like a few hours later, I might be kind of hungry. And mm -hmm. so I'll, I will eat something if it's like to the point where I'm, it's not a craving, but I'm like literally tired because I didn't eat enough. Yeah. I'm like, I shouldn't be tired at seven o'clock. I'm like, it's not that late. And then, yeah, no, I need to eat. So something. then do you eat in that circumstance? Yeah, I don't. Sometimes I'll like just won't if I'm preoccupied or doing something. But if I'm like really hungry, like there's like I'll eat something. I don't make myself suffer. Suffer for textbook rules. I mean, because yeah. there aren't there aren't any rules. This is just to, I think, create awareness around this topic. There's no um, like hard, fast rules around this. A no. lot of ways you do it. So. But I know when it's coming because it's like if it's just a normal day, a normal workout, I can normally just eat my three meals. If it's like I ran in the morning and then decided to lift in the afternoon and I had two workouts in one day, like I'm probably going to be hungrier later because I did way more right. stuff. Right. So it's yeah. just it varies depending upon that, basically. For sure. Yeah. So do all foods and drinks break your fast or is there something you can consume and still be fasting technically? So I really can't think of any food that really you can, I mean, all food is basically off limits when you're, when you're fasting. Yeah. Um, a lot of beverages will break your fast. There are a couple of things though. Like this morning I mentioned, I drink a cup of coffee. Um, keyword though, that I said there, I drink a cup of black coffee so this would not be like I went through the Starbucks drive through and got a vanilla latte and called it my coffee. Like, no, black coffee doesn't technically break a fast, but adding any sort of creamer into your coffee is going to break your fast. Make sense? Yeah, I, I used to hear like if it's under 30 calories, like total in your fasting time, it's still technically like fasting. I, I don't know. But I mean, you don't yeah. technically eat something. It's more like. I think if you had like lemon in your water or you chewed gum or yes. something like that, I yes. mean, coffee technically is like five or 10 calories. But. Right. Right. No. And I do think there is truth to that, but um, yeah, that doesn't mean like go grab three almonds. Cause that equals, that equals 30 <laughs> calories. If yeah. you're that hungry where you're like, just go eat some food. Um, yeah. But no, there, yeah, there's like little rules like that. I usually just tell people all things, like drink as much water as you want. Um, black coffee is fine. Um, even tea, if you're a tea drinker, um, but I've just had, sure. I've had like zero calorie electrolyte things. Yeah. That would be fine. Like I was going to say too, um, when you're just starting this out, if you find like you're getting a headache or you're just like really low energy, um, it could be as simple as like an electrolyte issue and like putting some sea salts, although not super palatable. Um, there are other products out there, but sea salt in your water um, can be helpful. Um, also too, for somebody who's um, like just wanting to start this and like maybe like right now you're a person who's basically you wake up at six o'clock, you start eating and you eat until you go to bed at 10 o'clock. Like you're nowhere near any type of intermittent fasting schedule. And all you're trying to do is get yourself on a 
12 hours on, 12 hours off, you're easing into it, but you wake up starving and you're a coffee drinker. You could even um, do just like a little bit of uh, coconut oil or MCT oil in your coffee. Um, and I've seen a lot of things that that actually doesn't even break your fast at all. Uh, yeah, it's uh, MCT oil uses like a different type of pathway to be metabolized where it doesn't yeah. really affect blood sugar. Cause I mean, it's just fat is all it is. Right. Um, but yeah, it's a different, I mean, it's different than, you know, eating actual coconut. Right. Right. So yeah, that can be a little hack and something that you can do, um, especially in the beginning to like try to increase your fasting time. If you're working towards going a longer one, but you just can't quite make it. Um, that can be a really helpful tool. I know my, um, like my husband does uh, fasting one day a week where he does like a long one. Uh, I don't even know how many hours, but he doesn't like do the daily thing. He just does like a once a week, mm -hmm. but he'll put MCT oil in his coffee because um, it can help him go a little bit longer without being in that feeding state. So it's a, it's a tool. Um, we'll call it that, but basically everything else um, breaks the fast. I do want to mention too, that, like, I'll, cause I just, I talk to a lot of people, um, and all of somebody say that they were like intermittent fasting and I'm talking to them a little bit more about it. And then all of a sudden it creeps into conversation, you know, the glass of wine, they pour themselves after the kids go to bed and they're sitting on the couch. And like, you do realize, even though it's a beverage, like that breaks your fast. So I think a lot of people think like, as long as they're not eating, like it's, yeah. they're still fasting, but alcohol like your beverage in the evening that is going to break your fast um i feel like you'd be hungrier sooner too because the alcohol with the insulin spikes right it'd probably wake up hungry or it's going to make you want to i mean if they were having a glass of wine instead of a pint of ice cream i guess that's a better option oh 100 yes <laughs> <laughs> but you can't really call it fasting then so no technically it. not so how often should someone fast well, um, we kind of touched on this, but it totally depends upon the type of fasting you're partaking in. So if you're just doing a restricted eating window, like us, um, eight hours of feeding, 16 hours of fasting, you could do that every day if you wanted to. Um, I don't see any issues with that unless you tend to be the person that falls into the category that I talked about that this might not be a good idea for. Um, but you could do that every single day if you're you know, choosing an eating window of anywhere between like six to 10 hours. Now, if you're going to do a full day fast, like there are some people that do that. That's not for me, but some people like that and see great benefit. Um, I wouldn't do that more than like maybe once a week, once or twice a month kind of thing. Um, so it just, it's totally dependent upon what style of fasting, I guess, that you're doing. Yeah, I've heard... I can't remember who it was. I don't know if it was Hubbard or which guy it was, but they're talking about they do a full day intermittent fasting, but they only do it like once every three months. Oh, like like a 24 hour fast. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. I mean, it's very individualistic. Obviously if you're that I've heard more beneficial for people that are like morbidly obese and really need to lose weight and can't be active because of their weight. Like that has really helped just having electrolytes, uh, zero calorie stuff for, periods of time like that right so it's yeah definitely individualistic for how often so much fast for, for sure yeah there's a lot of like trial and error that comes along with with doing this and trying this um it's it's honestly probably not a bad idea for somebody who's new to this to work with um a you know nutrition coach um dietitian um if your doctor's knowledgeable which you know, they may or may not have any training in that, but to work with somebody, especially if you're brand new to it, um, I wouldn't go from a normal, like eating the normal standard American diet to all of a sudden, like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to intermittent fast. I'm not going to eat for 16 hours. Probably not a great, great way to do it. So you may want to work with somebody to kind of help, um, trial and error with you, if you will. Right. So are there any negatives to fasting? Well, first of all, um, it just might not be suitable for everyone's lifestyle. We touched on that already in the beginning. You gave the example of like a construction worker. Um, you know, somebody who maybe leaves the house before the sun comes up and they're gone literally all day long um, and they're working a very active job. It's honestly probably that would be 
not a good idea. So the, the negative is just, it's not, it's not going to suit everybody's lifestyle. So although this conversation might sound really great to somebody, just know not everybody's lifestyle is suited to do this. Um, also a couple other things that can lead to, um, dehydration, um, to, for, for a couple reasons, but, um, one of them is we actually get a lot of water in our food too, you know, especially if you're eating a pretty clean, like diet with fruits and vegetables. So, um, I think sometimes people, um, then end up not getting enough hydration. So that can be a negative. Um, it can lead to like, people can get headaches when you start out on it. Um, a lot of times that's just a hydration issue though, making sure you're getting enough water and then electrolytes in your water as well. Um, it could cause hypoglycemia. So it could cause, um, dangerously, um, low levels in your blood sugar. So that could be a negative. Um, and also another negative I could see is I think it can cause people to overeat too and make poor food choices. Yeah. So, uh, for example, if you go, you know, you push it a little too long and then you're to the point where you are so hungry. I'm sure you've been there. I know I've been there before. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just, my day got away from me and I then get to the point where I'm ravenous. Then I am going to reach for anything and everything to fill myself up. And then we can end up making super poor choices, um, just quality of our food. And we can also end up eating way too much, even though it seems counterintuitive because we're compressing our eating window. So you would think naturally we're going to eat less. Well, depending upon how much somebody does it, it actually can lead to overeating too. Yeah. I feel like if someone has binge eating tendencies, it's not great yeah. diet to follow. I mean, if you're, if you're eating well-balanced meals in the eight hour time window, it's probably fine. Like two to three times. But I mean, I wouldn't try one meal a day if you have binge eating tendencies, because you're probably not going to see any benefits. No, no. Yeah, it's not like you can literally eat as many calories as you want, whatever you want, and you'll still get healthy. It's Yeah, and that's not what this um, practice of eating is. It's not just compress your eating window, but eat whatever you want, and you're going to get benefit. I mean, I'm still, like, quality is still super important of what you're eating and how much you're eating. It's not just, like, permission to eat whatever you want because you've fasted, so... Yeah, and a lot of the experiments that were first done in mice, what they did is they fed, I think they left the food in there for certain times a day for the one mice, and the other, they left it in there all day. And then the ones, I don't think they equated for, like, calories, like they had the same amount. I think they just left it in there, and the ones just grazed more, so they became fatter. Yeah, yeah. I believe that was how it's done. So you could still, yeah, you can... Calories are still some, you know, important. For sure. Yeah. So are there better foods than others to break your fast with? Um, so with this one, yeah. Like I would not. So whatever. I'll go back. Yeah, football player. That's a good example. I don't even know who this dude is. And I'm like referring to him. Like coming off of your fast with like just a bunch of sugar, not a great idea. Um, so better choices. Um, like I'm a big fan of like this morning for, I'll just use myself as an example. The first meal I ate after it wasn't really a true fast, but the first meal of the day, um, after my overnight fast, I had like a couple eggs. I had, I had some kind of meat leftover that I mixed in there, some leftover vegetables. I've not mentioned carbohydrates yet, not that. Um, and then I put some slices of avocado on top of it. And that was, and I cooked all this in butter. So I ate fat and protein. That was my first meal of the day. The advantage to that is this, that meal is sticking with me now and it's not making me want to like go spiral out of control and just go eat a bunch of other crap. So focusing on, um, especially when you're, you know, you're gonna be a little bit more hungry because it's your first meal of the day, right? So focusing on good quality protein and healthy fats for your first meal is going to be way better than coming off of it, eating a bagel and a bowl of cereal. And yeah, I would at least balance your food. I mean, yeah. you can still have carbohydrates in there, but just right. don't right. eat like just a piece of toast or something. 
Right. Yeah. So focus, mm -hmm. emphasize the protein and fat. I mean, carbohydrates, fine to eat with it, um, but make sure you're for sure getting the carbs and fat um, in there for your first meal. Here is uh, DK Here Met Metcalf. Big dude. What's his name? DK Metcalf. Yeah. See, Mike, I'm not, I know. My <laughs> husband would probably shake me right now. I hope he doesn't listen to this. He's really <laughs> embarrassed of me. Huh. Oh, it's fine. But yeah, that's the guy I was talking about. Um, so the last question is, what is the best way to get started on fasting for someone that's new to it? So if you're starting from square one, um, I'll give you a couple tips. Um, don't do it all. <laughs> like don't don't all of a sudden adapt uh, just an eight hour feeding window and fast for 16 hours. Um, start small. So a simple thing that um, you could do is whenever you wake up, Try to wait one hour before you eat your first meal. Like very, I know that probably sounds really simple to you, Mike, but for somebody who's eating all day long, like that's even a little bit of a challenge. Um, actually, who's the guy I was listening to? Huberman um, was talking about some research there of like, that's pretty strong. Just as we've evolved as humans, it's super important to for sure wait an hour and then two hours before you go to bed. Um, where you're not eating. So don't even pay attention to the timing, all of this. Just when you wake up in the morning, let's say you wake up at six o'clock, refrain from eating anything for at least an hour. Let's say you go to bed at 10 o'clock, try to refrain eating anything past eight o'clock. So having those kind of little bit of rules for yourself, obviously don't starve yourself, please. That's not what I'm telling people to do. Um, but starting with like little small things that you can do like that is really helpful. Um, I think the 12 hour overnight fast too is a really great starting point for somebody who's nowhere near, um, any sort of fasting or awareness of this. Um, cause I think that's just enough for somebody, for your body to get a break and feel some benefit to it. Um, and then you can just gradually increase maybe every couple weeks or so increase your fasting time by an hour. All right. And I think um, people should tailor it to their lifestyle because some people, you know, they want to eat dinner with their family. So you're probably going to not eat early in the morning where some people, you know, don't have a family. They're just single. Maybe they'd rather eat, you know, breakfast. And then they're just like, I'm not hungry for dinner. Cause I mean, you technically, if you're active through the day, you'll burn the calories you eat in the morning versus at night. But right. it also depends on total amount of calories you consume still. So, right. This, I think the big thing, um, it's kind of like, tips for people getting started too. Like this is not meant to add an extra stressor to your life either. Like this is meant to kind of free you a little bit, like so that you're not all consumed by your food all the time. Um, but yes, like you hit the nail on the head, like definitely want to tailor it to your lifestyle. How I eat is not going to be the same as how you eat because we live two different schedules and lives. Like for you eating your first meal, like I did today at eight o'clock, well, you're just barely rolling out of bed. That's not, that's not feasible. But for me, I'm like starving by that point because I've been up and moving and active for a while. So, but for me, then I have to be more mindful because I am up early, um, to not eat super late at night. And I think about that often, um, because I want to have that time where my body can rest and digest and chill out so that it's not constantly needing to digest my food. So for me, I'm a person who's going to be aware of my evening choices where you maybe have a little more leeway, like you're hungry at eight or nine o'clock to get away with, with eating because you sleep in a little bit later because you stay up late. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it just, it is, it's important to think about your lifestyle. And if your family, family dinner is super important and valuable. If your family can't sit down together until seven o'clock to eat, that's fine. But maybe then you'll more so work on your fasting in the morning. Yeah. And just because someone can't do it one day, like they're just busy, it doesn't mean you can't just do it tomorrow. Like you don't have to be strict with it every day. No. I mean, I'm not. You, there's benefit from even once a week if you do it. Um, like I'm not real great about it on the weekends because I I stay up a little bit later. My weekdays are pretty rigid because you got to go to bed pretty early if you wake up at four. Um, but on weekends, I might, you know, do a little bit more socializing, um, st stay awake a little bit later. Um, I don't, I'm not real picky on the whole intermittent fasting thing over the weekend or maybe somebody 
we go out to breakfast. I don't know. Don't sit and stress about it. You have to tailor it to your lifestyle. And there are still great benefits to fasting, even if you're not doing it regularly. Yeah. And some people, who is it? Thomas DeLauer or something? He has like certain days he fasts. Mm-hmm. He's a big fasting person. But um, yeah, I guess just pick what works for your schedule and don't make it seem like a chore. For me personally, it freed up my meals to be more calories and I feel more satiated because I used to eat, do the small meal thing. And I can tell you, I absolutely hated the small meal thing. Yeah. And I think you're probably a lot less susceptible to, to like dips in your energy throughout the day. You're a little bit more stable in the energy. That should be a benefit. People feel actually is increased energy. Um, because you're not having like the constant ebb and flows, blood sugar all over the place. So yeah, normally the morning your your brain functions uh, pretty crisp for a while till you eat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Any last remarks on intermittent fasting? I feel or like good- I co- no. I feel like I kind of covered. I'm sure I'll think of things later, but I think I kind of covered everything that I wanted to get across. If people want to learn more, do you have any like resources you would recommend? Um, I, well, I'm a big, we're doing a podcast right now, but I get a lot of my information from, um, podcast, um, on this kind of stuff. Uh, and then I meant to write these book titles down. Maybe we could link them or something, but there's a couple of really good books out there on, on intermittent fasting, um, for people who like to read, um, there's, uh, I'm trying. I'm pretty sure the one I read years ago was called the Eight Hour Diet. I'm looking it up real quick. That's the one I first read. Yeah, the Eight Hour Diet. It's called. Um, feast, I'll link it down below. Feast fast. Um, feast fast. Repeat. I think. I'm just double checking. Yeah, that's a newer one. Um, that's a really good. Um, guide to intermittent fasting. So yeah, if you want to write that down to link it. But otherwise, people, if you're listening. Um, yeah, fast feast repeat. Okay, I um, like that. So yeah, some good books out there on it, um, and a lot. I mean, it's a very it's a very popular topic. A lot of like any of your health podcasts out there, um, health professionals will probably have covered that at some point in in their show. Yeah, it's become pretty popular in the last decade, I'd say. Yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. See ya.